Hi, this is Mrs. T's Chem Talk for Physical Behavior of Matter, video three of three. Because you can see if this is video three of three, there was also a video one and a video two. So you can certainly go to my YouTube channel to find the other ones. Um, this is going to be, again, part of the Physical Behavior of Matter chapter, Mrs. T's Chem Talk Regions Chem. And in case you don't know who I am, I'm Elizabeth Tuminello. I'm a chemistry teacher at Calhoun High School in Merrick, New York. So the first thing that we're going to talk about in this video would be the gas relationships. I don't know why there's a random P there, um, but we have, you don't need to know the names of the relationships, but we have pressure versus volume, pressure versus temperature, or volume versus temperature. And for any of these different relationships, we could also um, reverse the variables. So like P could be down here and V could be on the y-axis because we can change pressure and volume. We can change temperature and we can change pressure. We can change temperature and we can change the volume. So we can reverse those variables on the graphs and they would still be the same shape. So as pressure goes up, volume goes down. It's an inverse relationship. As pressure goes up, temperature goes up. That would be called a direct relationship. And as volume goes up, temperature goes up as well. One of the things that I note is that the one relationship that doesn't have temperature in it is the one that is inverse. The other two relationships have temperature in them and they are direct relationships. We also have our combined gas law that we're going to use in order to um, talk about the relationships mathematically. For us, this is on table T, and it's P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. And for this particular formula, we must use Kelvin temperatures. So this is relating the pressure in any unit to the volume in any unit to Kelvin temperature only. And remember, if your temperatures are not in Kelvins, we do have the other formula on table T to help us convert our temperature from Celsius to Kelvin, which would mean adding 273 to the Celsius temperature to get the Kelvin temperature. So if we have a question that says as the temperature of a, of, at a temperature of 273 Kelvins, 400 milliliters of gas has a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals. If the pressure is changed to 50.65 kilopascals and the volume is changed to 551 milliliters, what is the new temperature? So I see a bunch of temperatures, volumes, and pressures, and I see that they, measure, that they mentioned a gas. So I'm going to write out my formula, P1 v1 over t1 equals p2 v2 over t2. I am going to list out the variables as they go as I so temperature this is the first temperature that I come to I'm going to write that as t1. 400 milliliters is a volume Pressure, 101.3 kPa. Pressure is changed to 50.65 kPa, and volume is changed to 551 milliliters. That means my temperature 2 is my x. I now see that I have both pressures in the same unit. I have both volumes in the same unit. I check that my temperature is in Kelvins, and it is. So that means that my X will come out in Kelvins because because it's the only unit that sort of didn't have a partner on the other side. For P1, V1 over T1, you can get your unit for your answer that way. Once I have that information, I plug those numbers into the formula in their corresponding positions. That's a parenthesis. Once I have this, I have two fractions set equal to each other, so I can cross multiply. 
and I set the two sides equal to each other. And once I cross multiply, I get 40520x equals 7618924.95. I divide both sides by what's in front of x. so that I can get x by itself. And I get that x equals 188 kelvins. You're going to use this formula any time you see temperatures, volumes, and pressures for a gas. If one of the variables was held constant, Let's say, for example, it said that pressure um, was held constant and only volume changed. If something is held constant, then you're going to cancel it out of the formula and just use the variables that are left. When we talk about the kinetic molecular theory, this is actually um, also sometimes known as the ideal gas law or the ideal gas laws. These are the pieces of information that we we go to when we're trying to figure out or trying to look at how gases behave. So first thing is that ideal gases would behave this way, but there is no such thing as a truly ideal gas. Hydrogen and helium being the lightest gases and the smallest gases with the weakest intermolecular forces would be the closest to ideal. So the kinetic molecular theory states that a gas is composed of particles and those particles are moving in random straight line motion. There is a transfer of energy between colliding particles, so they move in those straight lines until they hit something, and then they bounce off of each other. That's what the transfer of energy is, is relating to. They transfer energy and they bounce off of each other in different directions. Their individual volumes of the particles is negligible, meaning that the particles are much smaller than the volume of the total container that they're in and they have no, they're considered to have no forces of attraction for each other. And we also know that there are some exceptions. These exceptions, or the reasons why real gases don't follow all of the rules, would be, um, sorry, also the lightest gases follow the rules the best, that would be hydrogen and helium. The reasons would be real gases do have some volume, so larger molecules for gases would behave less ideally. And real gases do have some extent of attraction for each other. So the gases with the strongest intermolecular forces would move around the least randomly, so that would cause them to be less ideal. We also know that if we increase the temperature and decrease the pressure, that the highest possible temperature and the lowest possible pressure make real gases behave most ideal because this gets them really far apart from each other so we can minimize the effects of their volume and minimize the effects of their intermolecular forces for each other the further away they are from each other. We also have Avogadro's hypothesis which states that equal volumes of gases if held at the same temperature and pressure contain equal numbers of molecules so if all of these containers are held at STP, then oops, sorry, then each of these containers would contain the same number of molecules. We're not talking about individual atoms because neon here only has one atom per molecule. Nitrogen has two atoms per molecule and carbon dioxide has three atoms per molecule, but we're talking about the number of molecules. So if they're at the same temperature and pressure and they have this um, numbers of molecules will be found in each of those containers. So this was the, the uh, this is the end of the physical behavior of matter review videos. This was the end of video three of three different videos. So if you missed videos one and two, you can go back to Mrs. T's Chem Talk YouTube channel. If you just Google that, you'll be able to find it. Um, and you can see the other two physical behavior of matter videos. You can see a bunch of other videos for other topics as well. If you're one of my students and you're still confused, please come see me in extra help. And if you're not one of my students, you're certainly welcome to rewatch watch the video or search on my YouTube channel for other helpful videos. Have a good day. Happy studying guys and girls.